morning, friends. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning here at Trinity United Methodist Church. My name is Marissa Copeland, and I am one of the pastors here. And it is my joy to welcome each of you this morning. And I notice that we're a little student body. I believe this is right. I was never in theater or anything, but... We have a lot of friends up here in this part of our worship center, and that is because today is a very special day for our third graders. They are receiving their third grade Bibles, and so it is going to be a special time in worship this morning. I welcome those of you who are joining us online, and I am glad that you uh, are joining us from wherever it is that you are this morning. We'd love to know where that is if you would put that in the comment section. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here lots of times, we invite you to fill out something that we call a Connect Card. You can do this virtually online through the QR codes that you see on the screen, or there is a paper Connect Card that should be in your bulletin. This is a way that we get to know who you are and that you can share with us some of the prayer concerns um, that you might have or the ways that you are interested in learning more about how you can get involved here at Trinity. We love to take a look at these Connect cards and pray over those requests. And so we invite you to just take a few moments to fill that out this morning. We thank you so much for doing that. Um, It is a blessing to us week in and week out. This morning, we are also starting our new worship series called Brave Faith, which is based on the book Courage, Jesus and the Call to Brave Faith, written by our new bishop, Bishop Tom Berlin. And we will be in this worship series over the next several weeks, um, all about figuring out what it means to have courage, to um, be given this gift of brave faith, from God. What does that look like? And how can we live that out in our everyday lives? And so we are so glad that you have chosen to be with us this morning as we kick off that worship series together. And for friends, no matter where it is that you find yourself coming in from all of the places that you have been over the last week, we are so thankful you found yourself here, that you can take a breath and rest in the presence of God that we know meets us all here in this place. And so it is my joy to say to you today, welcome home. home. Indeed, it is great to be home, and I invite you to stand and to greet your neighbors this morning as we begin worship. Get your stuff out of there. Well, good morning, church. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. We invite you to stand and sing along with us. I'm covered in your grace upon grace upon 
Amen. Thanks for singing with us. Let's have a seat together. Well, good morning, church. I am pleased to be able to introduce to you all today's mission focus. Each week here uh, among Trinity, we have the opportunity to bless an organization or a ministry that is doing important work, often right here in our own community. Uh, Today, that's Mirror Image. Two years ago, summer of 21, I had the joy of an opportunity to meet Greg Bradley, the founder and visionary behind Mirror Image Leadership Academy. And at that time, he was just getting started with a first group of young men who would become the first cohort of students participating in this program. Two years later, uh, there's that group of young men who are now, uh, have just started the ninth grade, as well as a class of eighth graders and a a class of seventh graders, which was the idea for the model to begin with, and to see it coming to fruition is a beautiful thing. I want to give you a chance to take a look at a video that will give you a sense of some of the things that have been happening recently in Mirror Image, uh, and then offer a word of encouragement to you afterwards. Take a look at the video. Hello, everyone. My name is James Miller. I'm the executive director at Mirror Image Leadership Academy, and I would like to take a moment to thank our partners, our donors, and our supporters for your contribution to our organization this year. Please check out this highlight reel of our local, national, and international experiences during our summer academy this summer. Once again, if you want to know more about Mirror Image Leadership Academy, be sure to go to mirrorimageleadership.org. Thank you again, and see how you can make a difference. So what you just saw in that highlight reel are some examples of some of the exposure trips that uh, these young men have the opportunity to participate in. They start locally, uh, and during the school year, they have an experience once every month where they do this. Um, And then as they grow into the program, uh, the summer before their ninth grade year, uh, those boys who have remained in the program for two years uh, get the opportunity to take a trip to Ghana, which is what you saw in the early footage from that. Some of you helped make that possible this summer through the Christmas offer that we received last year for Mirror Image. Um, I believe I see James, is that James that I see back there at the back? James, James Miller, who, who you saw on screen and is the executive director. We're so glad James is here. And if you'd like to talk with him between services, he'll be out front. He'd love to tell you more about Mirror Image and you can go to their website, mirrorimageleadership.org. Today, if you want to make a gift that supports the work that they are doing, uh, you can do that through the QR codes for, uh, for making offerings as well as using a giving envelope that's in the racks in front of you. Uh, just make sure if you want to make a special gift for that in addition to regular ties and offerings, you make a note of that on the envelope or online so that we can make sure it gets directed to them. Uh, and we're excited, as I said, to be able to support that. 
And speaking of supporting uh, uh, children and families, uh, what a joy it is today uh, to celebrate third grade Bible presentations with 16 children um, and their families. So I want to invite Brian Whitstruck, our Director of Children and Family Ministries, uh, to come up and, and he'll tell us where to go from here because I have no idea. <laughs> If, uh, if our Bible presentation families wouldn't mind uh, standing up and we're going to gather over here, we're going to call you guys up one at a time, one family at a time, um, in alphabetical order, and uh, you guys are going to come right up and, and uh, our third graders are going to kneel. So just make your way over. I'm going to come up here. It really is cool that we have 16 young people receiving Bibles today. Um, it's a tradition in our church to give Bibles to third graders, and it's a long-standing tradition. I received my third grade Bible a few years back, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, a lot of folks. Luke, if your family would want to just come on down, we'll, get, we'll start making our way over here. I present Luke Bagby. Luke, we give this Bible to you on behalf of Trinity, and we pray that as you read these stories and as you hear these words, that Jesus will become real to you and you will follow him with your life. Evie, if you and your family would like to come forward. Evie, what a, sorry, I present Evie Catherine Bean. Evie, what a special day this is to be able to present this Bible to you, and I hope that as you read through its pages, you will come to know just how much God loves you and all that Jesus has in mind for you and your life in the days ahead. God bless you. Lillian, if you and your family could come forward. present Lillian Blake. Lillian, it is my honor to present you this Bible. And it is my prayer that as you read through its pages, you would come to know the love of God and uh, all of the ways that God invites you to lean into that love and to show love to others. So Madeline Bogler is unable to join us today. But we want to bring David and his family up. It's perfect. It's okay. All right. I present David Brown. David, we are grateful for God's presence in your life, and we pray that this Bible, the words shared, the stories relayed, will help you come to grow in your faith and to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Elle, if you want to come on down. present Elizabeth Craig Clugston. I love that eager smile. Mm -hmm. Elle, may the Holy Spirit inspire you as you read this Bible that in its pages you may find hope and encouragement, good news and strength, and even courage for faithful living as a follower of Jesus. Amen. Lillian.
present Lillian Grace Jackson. Lillian, I pray that the Holy Spirit meets you as you read the stories that are found in these pages, that through your reading you might come to know Christ and learn what it looks like to use all of the gifts God has given you to bring love into this world. Amen. Amen. Drake, if you and your family would like to make your way over here. I present Drake Ellis Wesley Lee. Drake, as you receive this Bible today, may it guide you and the words lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ that you will be a faithful follower uh, in all that you do and say. In his name, amen. Amen. God bless you. (laughs) Nolan, if you and your family would like to come over here. Present Nolan Asher Long. Nolan, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the inspiration from God's Word uh, be present in your life, shining brightly as you go out into the world to love and to serve, um, responding to God's call on your life. Amen. Amen. Noah, you want to come forward? I present Noah Burke Nakley. Noah, I pray that as you read through the pages of this Bible, as you uh, step into the stories and the words that God has given us, I pray that the Holy Spirit meets you, that you might come to know who Jesus is and how you might lean in to all of your gifts to serve Christ in all ways. Amen. Amen. Victoria, if you guys want to come forward. I present Victoria Lupita Perez. Victoria, we are grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and pray that as these words um, become a part of your life, that you will make your home in them and that you will find your home in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Emma. You guys want to come? I present Emma Pinkerson. Emma, may the Holy Spirit guide and lead you in reading God's Word and in paying attention to God's guidance on your life, that you may grow and be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ in all that you say and do. Amen. Eden.
I present Aiden K. Reem. Aiden, the Holy Spirit work within you that as you read through the pages of this Bible, as you step into the stories of God, that you might meet Jesus Christ and that you might grow into a faithful follower. Amen. You're welcome. Hunter. I present Hunter Charles Sutherland. Hunter, we are grateful for um, Jesus' presence in your life, for the ways that he is already working in your life. And we pray that as you read these words, that they will become real to you and that you will continue to grow and to thrive with faith and courage as a follower of Jesus. Amen. Colton. I present Colton William Trosper. Colton, as you open the Bible and read through its pages, may you discover in it so many places where you're reminded of God's love for you and inspired to be a follower of Jesus your whole life. Amen. Trace. I present Theodore White III. Trace, I pray that the Holy Spirit fall afresh on you, that as you read the words in these pages and listen to the stories, that you might know, come to know God's love for you and God's love made uh, known in Jesus Christ. Amen. So we want to invite the third graders who just received their Bible, if you all will all come and stand across the front right here um, so folks can see you one more time, and they want to bless you with a response to the presentation of the Bibles. Yep, you can stand right up here just on this row is great. Come on up here. What a crew, huh? Come on up, Hunter. What a joy it is. So, uh, indeed, may the Lord bless you and keep you. There is a response on the screens that we want to invite, uh, that we want to invite you all to join in now um, to our third graders. And then for you all, the third graders, when they're done, you'll see some words on the screen that you get to say back in response as a sign of um, thanksgiving for the gift that you've received today. So, let's join in this. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Holy Bible in your home, in your church school classes, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in our love for God's Word. And then, can you all see that on the screens? I'll say it with you. How about that? Let's say it together. This is from Psalm 119, verse 105. Let's begin. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. And I hope that you all will remember that as you take your Bibles with you today. And uh, I know Mr. Brian has some things planned for you to help you get to know it better um, and what you can find there in the pages. And so thank you all and thank you families for, for being a part of this time today. And we pray for you all as uh, you help your children learn and grow through the reading of scripture. One more time, let's celebrate these young people today. And you all can go rejoin your families. And so 
uh, all of you third graders and any other children who are here, you are invited to go with Mr. Brian for um, some, some time together with all of the kids. If you are new and you want your kids to go um, with Brian, please go back with them and check them in. Um, if your children want to stay with you in worship, you're always welcome to do that as well. So um, We'll see you later, kids. Y'all can go with Mr. Brian. Your families can come back and be seated. You can sit with, with uh, your families if you would. Yeah, take your Bibles with you because you're going to be using them. You all may have noticed that each of the Bibles had a, a carrying case on it. And the United Women in Faith made those uh, cases for all of the children. And um, we were blessed to be able to inscribe them as well. As we continue in worship this morning, we'll continue with a time of prayer, and I invite you to spend just a moment with me in silent prayer, and I invite you to lift up concerns for our world, for our community, um, the joys and concerns that you have in your own lives, I invite you to, to lift those up to God in prayer. I'll lead us then in prayer, and uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we come together this day seeking courage and hope for the future. In the midst of darkness and fear in our world, you call us to be a community of peace and love and of courage. You remind us of the blessings that we have and, and the opportunities to share those blessings with others. And we praise you and thank you for all those things and for your constant presence with us. Today, as we turn to you, we offer prayers, particularly for those who have uh, been affected and devastated by the earthquake in Morocco. We pray for the victims of those families, for all of those who have been hurt or injured. We also continue to pray for those who were in the path of Hurricane Idalia for those who lost homes and property, for those who lost loved ones. And we pray for your healing presence in their lives and that you will lead us, and particularly our early response team, to be able to continue to be your hands and feet on the ground. And, oh God, we celebrate this morning with, with those third graders who have received their Bibles we are grateful for each of those children, for their families, for the ways that they are, their families are seeking to help them to become uh, more faithful followers of you. And we pray that you will work through those words of scripture, that you will speak into their lives, um, that they will come to know your love and your grace, and that they will then continue to be courageous witnesses for you. Oh God, we, we have concerns that are on our own hearts as well, and, and we have joys and, and prayers of thanksgiving that we offer to you as a community of, the, of faith. We thank you, Lord, for your healing grace in our lives, for your sustaining love for us. We are confident in your abiding presence with us. So help, help us to be faithful to you in, in all times and in all places. And give us the grace to accept the forgiveness that you have offered to each of us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and we pray together the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you're following along in your bulletin, what comes next is not going to be what you see next in your bulletin. We're going to bump ahead a little bit to the time of the message, uh, because today uh, that is even going to be different than what you see. As we start this new series, Brave Faith, uh, we've made a little bit of a schedule change, and we are so grateful that Reverend Dr. Gary Mason uh, is with us this morning to kick off this series. Uh, Gary is a clergyman from Northern Ireland. Uh, Catherine and I had the opportunity to first get to know Gary uh, several years ago when we participated in a cohort that he led of pastors from around the Florida Conference um, talking about what it looks like to participate in peace building and reconciliation. Um, He has a lot of experience in that himself as a clergyman who was on the front lines of peace building in Northern Ireland during the time of the Troubles and continues that work there, as well as working with leaders uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian environment, as well as here in our own American context, uh, working with people across political divides, across theological divides. Um, And so he brings incredible wisdom and uh, courage to his work and and to his speaking. And so uh, it is my privilege to introduce the Reverend Dr. Gary Mason to come and preach for us this morning. Gary. Okay, it's great to be back with you here in Trinity. I kind of just commenting there to Joyce, I mean, where did the last year go when I met uh, Marissa there for the first time? And I want to commend Steve and Catherine as well as colleagues and friends. Uh, Now we're seven years, and just to be encouraged by their leadership and their commitment and their devotion to this space. I just want to do a couple of readings as we begin this series on courage and My understanding is they should be on the screen. Okay, so I'm just going to do the first Genesis section with a busy service today, and then I'll just flip to the Hebrews one. So just initially, the first three verses there in Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3. The Lord said to Abram, leave your land, your family, and your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you, I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, those who curse you, I will curse all the families of earth, they will be blessed because of you. And then just flipping to that Hebrews passage. By faith he lived in the land. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out without knowing where he was going. By faith he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob, who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sir received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. In the 1960s, uh, John Lennon, well-known member of that very, very famous pop group, The Beatles, said, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. December the 8th, 1980, in a street I was in literally in New York a few weeks ago in Upper West Side, John Lennon was assassinated by Mark Chapman, December the 8th, 1980. John Lennon was wrong because the Beatles will never be more popular than Jesus Christ. And those young people that received those Bibles today are receiving a book that was written on three different continents in three different languages by numerous writers. And here we are, September 10th, 2023, 
looking back 4,000 years to a person who grew up in a desert called Abraham. Abraham had immense courage. And I think the writer of Genesis stretches all our imaginations to anticipate what it would have been like for Abraham to launch out literally into the unknown. Uh, the brilliant Jewish theologian Jonathan Sachs, commenting on Abraham's life, says this, Abraham is the paradigm of an own heroic hero, a person who Sachs suggests does what is right because it is right, and not for the sake of popularity or fame. He says, if we were to find Judaism in Abrahamic terms, it would be the heroism of an ordinary life, being willing to live by one's convictions, though all the world thinks otherwise, being true to the call of eternity, not the noise of now. And as your pastoral team prayed for those kids today, we all should be praying in a world with many, many competing theories and visions. We want those kids to be true to the call of eternity, which will last, not the noise of now. Is it any wonder that this person, Abraham, came to symbolize so many things to those of us in church who are his descendants? I mean, most of all, Abraham stands out as a person of faith. And Sachs commenting on that uh, Hebrew phrase, lik laka, which simply means go by yourself. In other words, don't be grouped into a crowd. Have the courage and the conviction to go by yourself. And Abraham left by himself, pushing out into the unknown. So for us today to be a child of Abraham is to have the courage to be different to challenge the idols of this 21st century in which we live, but also to challenge the idols of other ages. So in an age of polytheism, that meant seeing the universe in which we live as a product of a single creative will, not this kind of meaningless trash that passes for life, but something that's coherent, something that's lasting, something that's eternal, something that is meaningful. In an era of slavery, it meant refusing to accept toxic theology, which was propagated as being Christian and in the name of God, but challenging it in the name of the Almighty. When power was worshipped, it meant being part of a society that ensured that we cared for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And during centuries in which humankind was sunk in ignorance, it meant honoring education as a key to human dignity and creating schools to provide universal literacy. And when the test of manhood meant war was the key component and meant striving for peace. In our alleged so-called sophisticated 21st century, in an age of radical individualism, it means knowing that we are not what we own, but what we share, not what we buy, but what we give, that there's actually something higher in all our lives in this room today than our appetites and our desires, but namely a call that comes to us as it came to Abraham from outside ourselves, summoning us to make a contribution to the world. So I just want to flip up four things that I see. You may see other things in Abraham's life, and that is fine, but just highlight four areas that I think as servants of God in the 21st century, living in the United States, that we can learn. The first thing I see in his life is what I'm calling expectations. Because all Abraham had to go on was this mysterious feeling 
that God wanted him to go on a journey. I mean, Abraham was more than a person who was just wondering, because God gave him a personal pronoun. He said, as for you. And he says to all of us today, who he speaks to individually, I will make a covenant with you. You must keep the covenant and teach it to your children, and I will be your God. So what this church did today was continue a covenant that's been going for thousands of years. When those kids come up and receive that Bible, teach it to your children and your children's children, that is leadership in an increasingly skeptical age. Dipping back into ancient wisdom, wisdom that has stood the test of millennium, not decades, or centuries. I also see in Abraham's life, and all of us need to hear this, including me today, I see imperfections. Because all of you who are parents, if I messed up as a parent, yes. And for you younger people who naturally like to criticize your parents, and I did it as a teenager, I once saw a brilliant t-shirt in Greenwich Village in New York City that said, ask a teenager now while they still know everything. So, it is. so so we all mess up, and you teenagers who will become parents, you will mess up too. It's the story of life. And so even the great Abraham, who those younger children who knelt and were prayed over, he's going to be one of the first names as they flip open that Bible in a matter of days or weeks' time. And they're going to find out he failed to keep his part of the covenant. But even though he did, God still took Abraham where he was, mixed up, wavering back and forward between faith and doubt, and slowly moved him forward. I mean, Abraham was a questioner, asking God, I mean, look, how am I to know? But God's just told you, Abraham, but he still goes back to God and says, how am I to know? It just reeks of doubt. And I think all of us, including me, I'm happy to use myself as a guinea pig. Have I doubted God? Yes. I've often said publicly, if I ever walk away from God, and I pray I don't, it'll not be over creation versus evolution. Is the Bible the Word of God that Jesus writes and the dead? I struggle with the mystery of suffering. That's where my doubts come in. I think we all have struggled with those concepts. But even though Abraham, like you and like me, asked those questions of God, God didn't give up on Abraham. He had his blind spots, a little bit of lying on the side, a little bit of bribery. But we need to realize in church today that perfection is not a requirement for God to deal with us. I mean, look back through that panorama of Scripture. The life of David, certainly not pretty in aspects. Solomon, with all his wisdom, made some of the most disastrous mistakes any person could make. I mean, Jacob deceives his blind father. Married, he despises his wife, Leah. He nurses a secret love for his sister, Rachel. So here is Jacob caught in trickery, theft, unfaithfulness, polygamy. But I know at some stage this church this year will sing hymns worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, yeah, and Jacob. That's one of the reasons I believe the Bible. For the skeptics and the cynics that doubt it. If I was writing it, I most certainly would not include in the Bible some of the incidents that are in it. It is not a perfect book. It shines a light on people like you and me and those darkened spaces that none of us want to spill into the public space. And in reality, to me, the book just reeks completely of integrity, openness, honesty, and truthfulness. I mean, even Paul, whose letters we read theologically and pour over, I mean, Paul was impatient. 
He was harsh with convict or converts who uh, wouldn't live up to that ascetic lifestyle. I mean, Jonah wanted to burn an entire city to prove his prophecies against another nation. And I often think of that occasion after the resurrection when Jesus is with Peter. Could you imagine what the church would have done to Peter after denying Christ? Oh, you're, you're not coming to Holy Communion for two months. You're standing down from your leadership position. What did Jesus say? Three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And what did Peter, I mean, Peter was the kind of sort of big mouth of the New Testament. You know that, always shooting his mouth off. Peter realized this, that Jesus wasn't going to hold his imperfections against him. Can you imagine how freeing that realization must have been? A forgiven failure entrusted with the keys of the kingdom of God. And Abraham, like this panorama that I've just highlighted, they're applauded in Hebrews. I mean, read Hebrews 11 and 12. This almost group of people who had messed up completely, that's a chronological game, a panorama of faith. I also see in Abraham's life acceptance. Abraham was asked, as we know, it's one of those riddles of Scripture. I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac. I mean, all of us have faced those situations, not necessarily sacrificing children. But what do you do with God when life doesn't make any sense? Because that didn't make any sense. There was nothing logical. I want you to take your son to Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son. The real lesson here is when life didn't make any sense, Abraham still obeyed and followed God. And let me just say this theologically. There are many interpretations around this, but this story is more than an attempt to explain why the Hebrew faith alone in the ancient world rejected child sacrifice. That's part of the story. But it's also a story of holy ground, a place where radical obedience to God and deep religious faith was implemented. Abraham didn't have all the answers. It's almost like the book of Job. For us sophisticated 21st century Westerners, we get the book of Job because we read the first chapter. Job didn't read the first chapter and had the right to ask 101 questions. But he still said, even though God slays me, I will trust in him. And I remember one writer commenting on that said this, sometimes God must appear to be the loser on planet earth in order to be the winner of unseen battles taking place in the heavenlies. And that only makes sense when you look at the Bible contextually and as a full 66 books. Because Paul writes that we don't battle against flesh, we battle against principalities and powers. But Job still provided leadership as Abraham did. The final thing I see in Abraham's life is resolve. Abraham had an experience that most people in this church will experience, death, unless Jesus comes back. He's on his deathbed, and the burning issue in his mind was the covenant he made with God. When he was ready to die, he wanted to get his son Isaac a wife. But he uses that brilliant phrase. As he asks his servant Haran to go back to get a wife for Isaac, he says, see that you do not take my son back there. So what's the lesson for all of you today? Because for all of us sometimes, in all our lives, if we're honest, mistakes in the past, incidents in the past, failed relationships in the past are shaping the future. That happens to all of us. 
The lesson of Abraham's life as he came to the end was put it in proper perspective. The past is meant to be learned from, not lived in. And all of us know we do that individually. We do that as churches. I'm sure this church has a great history as you look back. But you can't define yourself by your history. You define yourself by your vision for the future. And that's why God said to Abraham, go, and Abraham went. So as a church in the 21st century in the United States, living in a very contested space politically and religiously, what is your vision as a church when God asks you to go? And how do you find that? And how do you put that together? So when those final moments come, as you look back on your life, or even if that final moment doesn't come, and Jesus does come back, there's one thing I do know if you're talking about ultimate leadership. Because I do know this, when the final eschatological curtain falls on planet Earth, and one day it will, it will not be Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, Bill Clinton or Joe Biden that will be standing in this final stage. There'll be one person. It's not going to be Abraham. It's going to be Jesus Christ. And Trump, Biden, Clinton, Obama, Matt Seitung, Vladimir Putin, Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, Rishi Sunak will simply realize they were two-bit actors in a drama produced by another person called Jesus Christ. And I say that unashamedly. So I'm asking you to follow eternal leadership, eternal principles. Politics is temporal. The gospel is eternal. I watch this nation closely. I've been here over a hundred times. And as one writer recently says, politics has a strong grip on our hearts. The gospel's grip should be stronger. So I'm asking you on a shame as a church today, in your life, what shapes it? Eternal principles or temporal principles? We're talking about a person who grew up in a backwater of a dusty desert called Abraham. And his life had so much meaning eternally. We're talking about him in the richest country in the world 4,000 years later. Because he chose the eternal, not the temporal, not popularity. He chose what lasts. And I ask you, as a church, as Jesus would simply say, go you and do likewise. Amen. As we come to the time of Holy Communion this morning, I invite those of you who are joining us online to uh, find elements, bread, crackers, juice, or wine, and join us in this holy meal. Because friends, here at this table is the place where God's faithfulness collides with Jesus's convicting courage, the courage of love for us where we are invited to come and to taste and to see that Christ is good, that grace extends far beyond these walls, that grace is eternal. And so we remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks to you, O God, and broke that bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when that supper was over, he then took the cup, gave thanks to you, O God, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. 
So this morning, we are invited to come and to experience the everlasting and eternal grace that is offered in this moment. Will you pray with me? O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. O oh God, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes once again in final victory and we can feast together at that peaceful heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I invite the communion servers to come forward at this time. And as they make their way and prepare the table before us, I invite you that as you make your way forward, if you have um, envelopes for offering for either our mission focus or our regular tithes and offerings, we invite you to bring those forward um, to place them in the offering boxes before you or in the offering box in the rear of the worship center. Friends, the United Methodist Church open, celebrates an open communion table. That means you do not have to be a member of this church or any church to come and to receive the grace that is offered here. So come, come with your hearts open and receive the courage and the grace offered here. If the mountains were where you hide Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys If you graced the other side Oh, how long have I chased rivers From lowly seas to where they rise Against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not.
Who could dare ascend that mountain, that valley hill called Calvary? For the one I call Good Shepherd, or like a lamb was slain for me. Let's stand and sing together. Oh. Friends, as you go out from worship today, if you would like uh, to say a word of thanks or appreciation or, or just get to know him for a moment, uh, Gary will be out front to greet you. Uh, Gary, once again, we're just so glad that you've been with us today and thank you for bringing uh, both an encouraging and a challenging word for us as the people of faith here at Trinity. So, yeah. Okay, let's pray together. Gracious God, in a world of choices, 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 individually and corporately as a church, help us to make eternal choices at last. In Jesus' name, amen.